and the speaker today is Jesus Lozano Fernández. He is currently a lecturer at the University of Barcelona, uh, but he did the, the PhD uh, at, the, I would say here, but it was not sure it was here at that time, at the Institute of uh, Evolutionary Biology uh, in 2014. And then he did a, a postdoc at, at Bristol in UK for several years in Marie Curie. And then when he came back, he got all these several grants that you get in this system with the Juan de la Cierva, Beatriz de Pinos, Juan de la Cierva again. Uh, and now he's going to talk about what he's doing now, uh, well, all, what he has been doing uh, for all this time, which is to study metazoans evolution eh? and using molecular data and, and fossils. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much. So yeah, thanks Ramon and the rest of organizers and, and all, for, all you for being here. Uh, so uh, I would uh, like to talk a bit about my ongoing research and also the, the, the past a bit, half it would be about what I've done, but I also would like to, to talk a bit about what I plan to do. Uh, so I am a phylogenomicist and I also have a background in paleontology and I am interested in the first stages uh, during animal evolution. Uh, I use this unique perspective to understand, for example, things like uh, where did the animals come from, when did it happen, and what was the geological background. So I like to pick uh, different pieces of evidence uh, to reconstruct the deeper history of, of, of multicellular organisms. For example, I would like to address how uh, marine organisms went out of the water to conquer an alien and hostile environment such as the land. So I look at how these animal branches are uh, interconnected to each other, which is absolutely essential to understand, for example, the origin of modern animals or the origin of anatomical traits such as the neurons or the respiratory system. And we must know the, the phylogeny to reconstruct that story. So I will start a brief, uh, briefly with, with my personal history. Uh, so I, as uh, someone mentioned, I did, I did my PhD exactly in the very same building uh, at the IBE uh, with uh, Xavier Bellez working on the evolution of insect metamorphosis uh, using functional genetic tools. Then as a postdoc, uh, I moved to, to Bristol as a Marie Curie, uh, and then I started to work with genome scale ph uh, phylogenetics and, and paleontology, as you will see later. This uh, led me to work, uh, to come back to Barcelona with uh, different uh, fellowships, and just uh, around a year ago, I, I became a, a lecturer in genetics uh, at the University of, of Barcelona. So as a postdoc, I, I changed topics. Uh, and these animals that you are seeing here are very influential in, in what I have been doing. Uh, these are Shifazuran. They are commonly known as horseshoe crabs uh, and Casola de las Molucas in Catalan. The, they are a group of marine uh, arthropods and although fully aquatic, uh, they live on the sea, once every year they, they go out of the water to, to the shore uh, or, to, or to reproduce and lay eggs. And this is believed to, that they have been doing this during hundreds of thousands of millions of years. So on the left of the image, we have an Euthycarcinoid, okay? This is an next in marine arthropods that is not related with horseshoe crabs. What is interesting <coughs> is that there are Cambrian trace fossils made by these organisms, supposedly on the shore, so out of the water, on the coast. So we are seeing this amphibian behavior during the Cambrian, more than 500 million years ago. And this resembles uh, what horseshoe crabs do nowadays. Uh, so within arthropods, what we found is the oldest animal evidences for uh, activities out of the water on the land. This is a scheme uh, with the main groups of living arthropods uh, with aquatic lineages here on the left and terrestrial ones on, on the right. We have two groups of marine chelicerates, the sea spiders, and as I comment, the horseshoe crabs, and the crustaceans. And at the right, we have the terrestrial lineages, such as the arachnids, uh, the myriapods, by centipedes and millipedes, and then the hexapods that contains insects. Uh, so uh, based on this current, uh, current phylogenetic consensus, there have been at least three independent water to land transitions. The one of the terrestrial arachnids from uh, aquatic uh, chelicerate groups, the one from myriapods uh, with a common ancestor on, with pancrustaceans, and one of insects with a, an ancestor shared with a crustacean group. So the 
process of conquering the land is not as widespread as one may think. Most animal phyla, for example, uh, around this uh, less 40 to 50 animal phyla, are basically marine. Uh, just with invertebrates, for example, they just had one single event uh, of terrestrialization that took place in tetrapod, giving rise to amphibians, reptiles, dinosaurs, or, or, or mammals. So most phylum are, are basically marine, and terrestrialization is not a widespread phenomenon. So what I do is to reconstruct these processes by inferring phylogenies uh, with molecular data. And they result in, in topologies with a relative ranks length. Uh, and then through using the molecular clock methods and being able to constrain some of these clades with information from the fossil record, we can transform these phylogenies into time scale and derive the origin of certain groups, lineages, or traits. And the fossil record indeed uh, provides the only direct uh, source of data to understand both the origin and the presence of certain lineages, which allow us to estimate, for example, mass extinctions that otherwise it would be really difficult to, to know, as well as temporal acquisitions of anatomical characters such as the nervous system or digestive system. So phylogenies and molecular clocks complement uh, this record to constrain the timing and origin of these groups. And now talking specifically about my research in the past, this is my first publication out of my postdoc and represents one of the first efforts to integrate molecular and paleontological data to resolve how many times and when arthropods conquered the land. What we did is establish a chronology of these different independent colonization events, uh, founding that three independent events, one within arachnids, one within myriapods, and one within exapods. And this, this was like, this paper was the foundation of the research line that I am currently developing. On those same analyses, uh, we infer that branchiopods, that are a group of mostly freshwater crustaceans, was the closest uh, relative of in insects, suggesting a colonization of land maybe through a uh, Exapod ancestor that went through a freshwater route. Uh, but at that time, there was a second candidate group to be, to be the common, to have a common shared ancestor with hexapods, that was the enigmatic tremipids. And I will talk to you a bit about this group of crustaceans. This group is very interesting for many reasons. First, uh, they live, okay, this image is cropped, but you should here like see a uh, this is like, uh, it should be a pond, okay? Uh, they leave this in these ankyaline caves with indirect connections to the sea. They are venomous and they are top predators in their uh, small ecosystems and they prey in other small crustaceans. So far, just around 30 species have been uh, described and they present a really weird distribution. Mostly a uh, few species described in the Korean, two species described uh, in the Canary Island and one species described uh, in uh, Western Australia. Uh, so I contact with a team of cave divers led by Tom Eilif, and we collected a few specimens uh, from the Caribbean regions to sequence the transcriptome and addressing this problem of the origin of hexapods. But so by the time we start to analyze the samples, uh, we got scooped. So another research team published a paper on, on the topic confirming the relationship between remipid and, and hexapods. Nevertheless, we keep going. Now we have our remipids plus the ones that they sequence, and including these uh, up to five remipids, we, we, we corroborate the, the previous findings that at the end this is good. Uh, so now there are strong arguments to believe that, to believe that insects and remipids have a shared common uh, ancestor. Sadly, as uh, remipids are so specialized, making general inference about the water to land transitions is not that easy with this group. So as I briefly introduced earlier, now I'm going to talk about a different group of arthropods. Uh, I am talking about chelicerates that are heterogeneous, but all of them share their characteristic move part, the chelicera. Most forms are predators or parasitic and include arachnid groups such as the spiders, the ticks, the scorpions, or lesser known groups such as resinulates. Uh, whereas all these arachnids are terrestrial, pycnogonids and the horseshoe crabs are, are fully marine, uh, as we, I commented before. And uh, just giving some more info on this group, because uh, people sometimes are confused, they are not actually crabs. You can see that they have a chelicera, okay? They are not uh, crustaceans. 
They are considered as living fossils because their morphology remains unchanged for hundreds of millions of years, as their fossil records suggest. And at present, they are composed by just four species. Even in the past, they were more diverse. And they have this amphibious behavior of mating and laying eggs out of the water once a year. So the biggest achievement of my Marie Curie fellow uh, at Bristol was building a phylogeny of this group using genome scale uh, data sets, which is known as phylogenomic method. We found that all terrestrial chelicerates group together, and horseshoe crabs are their closest relative. Okay? We see spiders as the sister group of the rest. This topology is consistent with a single water to land transition event in the ancestor of arachnids. With those results, uh, our next inquiry was dating the origin of the group and its main diversifications. For that, I will explain to you just a bit how this method works. The way we do is that we incorporate the information uh, from the oldest fossil member of each group that we have a uh, fossil record, uh, which will inform us about the minimum age of the clade. Uh, therefore, for example, if we look at the Shifosurans, they cannot be younger, this group, than their oldest fossil evidence. So their age should precede that of the most ancient known group of that fossil, okay? So when we build these time trees, uh, this is, I am showing a dated phylogeny of chelicerates. This tiny blue circle circ represents the age of those calibrations that I showed you before. And the gray plots in here they, they represent intervals of, of confidence of, for that particular age of each of these nodes. We found, for example, that uh, this is the node that arachnids originated and presumably uh, colonized the land under this topology in dates comprising the, the Cambrian and Ordovician. We are talking about 500 million years ago. Similarly, uh, as branch lengths in phylogenies are the product of rate and time, we have been able also to, to calculate Rate, uh, rates of amino acid substitution in the past. So we test these uh, macroevolutionary patterns and found that the rates of molecular evolution were high during the origin of arachnids, uh, almost like 500 million years ago, suggesting that maybe after the common ancestor colonized the land, they, they have a, a rapid radiation. These results are in agreement with other previous uh, studies in arthropods that estimate not just the, the, the rates of molecular evolution, but also the rates of molecular, the morphological, sorry, uh, evolution were high at the onset of the Cambrian. At the same time we published our results, uh, another research team published a phylogenomic uh, study with a few key differences from ours. And it, that is, is this group, the horseshoe crabs, were nested within arachnids rather than being their sister group as, as we get. They have performed a more recent phylogenomic analysis on that line, retrieving the, the same conclusions in a more recent study. So uh, we have these contrasting things. And what does imply the, the results of this, uh, the other research team uh, had? So under that novel scenario, either the ancestor of horseshoe crabs were terrestrial and returned to the sea, which I, I believe is unlikely given that we have a abundant and really old fossil record from exclusively aquatic horseshoe crabs. Or it could be the case that there has been multiple uh, independent invasions of the land from some groups of arachnids. And I guess this is the, the second kind of uh, way of seeing what could have happened is what they are uh, promulgating this, the other research group. But when we had these results, we received a little bit with skepticism, given that, given that fossil record of aquatic chelicerates, other than Shifosuran, is extensive uh, and it goes back almost for uh, half a billion years. And we don't find in any of these chelicerate fossils that live on the sea transitional forms to terrestrial groups. So based on all this knowledge of the fossils, we for example, we check things. Uh, wow, okay, the image has been lost, but imagine in here we should see a complex eyes and here a simple eye that this has been somewhat in arachnid's crop. 
But the thing is, uh, all Chifosurans and other aquatic chelicerates, they present a, comp a compromise, a really complex set of eyes. Instead, all the arachnids have a simplified eyes, okay? All, all arachnid groups. So uh, if arachnids are monophyletic, this is like the traditional hypothesis, this simplification of eyes in arachnids may be present in their last common ancestor. But under this new hypothesis in which Shifosurans are a group of arachnids, all terrestrial arachnids likely lost these compound eyes and convergently adapt these simple eyes. This is one potential explanation to, to, to understand the morphology if that scenario was, was, was real. So what we did is we used a study in which we put together morphological, paleontological, and molecular evidence, and we, we, we built what we believe was the most likely scenario for the history of chelicerates, uh, including the uh, certain uh, acquisition of certain anatomical traits that are exclusively of certain groups. And, and we, we, like, we make a case to, see, to say that still we feel uh, based on our results that arachnid monophyly uh, should be, or it was the, the likely scenario. Okay, so finally, another contention, contentious issue uh, is not so regarding the topology, this relationship, but also about the, the time in which those water to land transitions took place. So most molecular estimations suggest a uh, Cambrian origin of these terrestrial groups. Uh, even though the fossil evidence uh, are hundreds of millions of years younger. So you, for example, all these crosses will represent the oldest known fossil evidence, whereas these yellow bars will represent more or less the confident intervals of ages in which when we do molecular clock estimates. So we just published this, this paper with a provocative title saying that where there's a, a Cambrian explosion on the line, uh, in which we discuss uh, poten the issue and potential solutions to, to resolve this thing robustly. Uh, one thing uh, when we do molecular clocks is maybe this disagreement is because there are biases in the method, in the molecular clock methods, or there are biases in the fossil record, in the like, literal reading of the fossil record. Uh, we expect to develop a research plan uh, to find out the origin of these discrepancies. So now forward uh, to the present and the research that we are currently pursuing. The, the main goal of our group is to resolve the early evolution of animals and of certain anatomical traits and developmental traits using uh, genome data and fossil data. Uh, this is a diagram uh, that appears on the book of Charles Darwin on the origin of a species. I think maybe it's the only figure that it presents. And actually it shows a, a timeline within living and fossil lineages. So our aim is to do the same for the onset of the, of the animals. So we are carrying actually two main research lines. One deals with solving uh, the most controversial issue in regards of uh, arthropod terrestrialization, and a second one on the origin and diversification of the main animal groups. Uh, none of them are specifically funded yet, but hopefully uh, this year uh, will, this situation will be solved because uh, I, we, are, we apply to, to a few grants. Uh, so there is, this is a summary of a current arthropod phylogeny. Uh, one of the three uh, ancient independent waters, just one of these three uh, ancient uh, independent colonizations of land has been put uh, into question is the, the one of, of arachnids. Uh, and maybe there, there, is, there is, historically there has been problems of morphological convergence of, uh, sorry, of unrelated uh, groups, uh, such for example the hexapods of the myriapods, because both of them, uh, they breathe through trachea, they have been uh, in the past uh, put as a, as, a, as a common group, but this was like Actually, this was a case of morphological convergence. So we, we, we feel that it's really important to, to address this question that maybe there is the case that there is a morphological convergence in arachnids. So the answer is important because it will determine whether these shared morphological traits are the product of common inheritance or actually real, they are a, a case of a massive uh, evolutionary convergence. So these are the two hypotheses uh, to test. 
in, in one of them, we have like a group of terrestrial chelicerates, which suggests maybe a single uh, invasion of the land. The second one, the situation is much more complex. So now going a bit into the details of what we are doing and what we will be doing during next years, uh, things got a little bit complicated. First is because the deeper branch that leads to, to, to arachnids have a really short branch that suggests a rapid diversification. And when someone tries to infer a phylogenetic reconstruction of these uh, short branches, there is normally a, a problem, it's not easy. Second is that several chelicerate groups have experienced multiple rounds of whole genome duplication. And this is a mess uh, because uh, what it happens is once you have these multiple uh, ancestral genome duplications, it's not easy and straightforward to determine which genes are orthologous, meaning that those genes that are the product of a speciation event instead of a duplication. So, so this is something that is challenging for this particular phylogeny, and we would like to address uh, because the, one of the issues that we are experiencing is that we are lacking proper genomic resources for, for many calicerate groups. Uh, we would like to sequence a, high, a couple of high-quality genomes for those arachnid groups that have been suggesting as potential uh, sister groups of Shifosurans. Another thing that we would like to do is to characterize the gene expression of Shifosuran of these horseshoe crabs during embryogenesis, to put it in a comparative framework. So maybe this will be useful as a potential synapomorphy to discard or support uh, one of the two hypotheses. So among the things that we would like to do is there are recent studies that suggest that there is conservation at the chromosome level between distal lineages, such as different phyla like amphioxus and a sponge and a jellyfish, okay? We would like to test this methodology in chelicerates to find if we could find shared uh, macrosynthetic patterns, how the, the genome, if there are traits of uh, shared uh, elements within different uh, chromosomes. And another thing that is more challenging is we would like to breed horseshoe crabs in captivity with the initial aim, in our case, of characterize uh, their gene regulation uh, at the embryo level. Uh, nonetheless, as I'm going to show you, this, this reading of these animals will be uh, useful for many other things. Uh, this, this, this is something that people have tried, uh, but it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy because they have a really long cy uh, cycle. They, 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 uh, they, at least they spend 10 years to reach the adulthood. Furthermore, they just reproduce uh, once a year in a really specific set of conditions going out of the water. Uh, and on top of that, uh, in the wild, uh, some of them are harvested for ph pharmaceutical applications. Almost a million uh, individuals each year are taken into uh, big pharma companies and they extract this uh, blue uh, blood. The, this is because they have emotionine and when exposed to the air, it has this blue color. And this is something that is used uh, for detecting con contaminants in chirurgic materials. So, so far, uh, this is something that is do, done every year. And the, the, one of the species, that the American one, is like being really affected by this uh, management because this is, uh, so far, there is no equivalent or good molecule to do this. So uh, being able to, to culture them and test several variables to enhance, for example, more reproductive cycles will be good like as to set as a basis of having these animals uh, as a system model instead of using them from the wild to, to test, uh, to, to, to extract this, this, this blood. Uh, this is our initial aim to characterize this the gene expression uh, at the molecular level of these horseshoe crabs during stages that are equivalent to the ones that have been studied in, in other uh, chelicerates such as the spiders. As you can see, the, 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 the total time is much, much longer for, for horseshoe crabs. So in conclusion, uh, what we would like to do uh, at the moment, our ongoing studies is to find patterns of chromosome scale conservation in chelicerates to understand their evolution. 
we, in, t in terms of method, we are benchmarking orthology detection methods to, 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 to see uh, if they can handle these problems with these uh, ancestral whole genome duplications. And we would like to culture horseshoe crabs to characterize their embryogenesis and reproduction. For the second research line, uh, is in the earliest history of animals. We go back a little bit on time. And then the undergrad has just joined the lab and is working on the topic. Um, so concerning animal evolution, historically we assume like a simple story in which sponges uh, were the sister group to the, to the rest with their closest relative uh, being the unicellular chronoflagellates. Uh, and then we got more complex animals, assuming a single origin for certain traits, systems that are not present in the sponges, such as the nervous system. But the first genome scale phylogeny that included tinophores, uh, a marine phylum of gelatinous predators, suggested a novel hypothesis in which uh, them uh, were the most uh, distantly relative of the rest, okay? It changed this branch for the other. This hypothesis overturns everything that we took for granted because implies that traits such as neurons, such as the muscles, such as the gut, either evolve convergently twice, or more than likely evolve once uh, in their common ancestor and were lost in sponges. Some people have argued that these results are the phylogenetic artifact in which long branches are attracted to the root, uh, what is known as long branch attraction. And tinophores indeed have a long branch that suggests that all known species uh, have a high evolutionary rates and are somewhat related. So I became interested in this topic uh, when I traced a timeline for the origin of animals and put them into the context of uh, the earth, earth history. We, we found that the most, uh, most of the origins for complex multicellularity, both in fungi and animals, happened during the last uh, billion of years. And the ages that we got doing molecular clock method were in relatively good agreement uh, with the fossil record, just being preceded by a uh, hundred uh, million years, also a couple of hundred million years. More recently, uh, we also uh, address specifically this, uh, this, this first split of the animals. Okay, here I think I cannot see, but this is a new a recent publication by Giacomelli. And this is more methodological one, and we tested a way of uh, reducing the the 20 amino acid alphabet into lesser categories. We do that because uh, it has been shown that it reduces the level of homoplasty. So if you have fewer categories, there are some changes that does not count, and there are some changes that you put more weight on them. And when we apply this amino acid data recordings, what we found is the support for one of the particular hypotheses, a sponge sister, increase. But as you have seen, this is like very complex. This is uh, generating a lot of uh, debate. And for example, you can see here, as since this first study in 2008, periodic publication have favored one hypothesis or the other, like ping pong. And this has been going on for almost 15 years. So most attempts focus on increasing the sampling, mainly with transcriptomic data, which quality hasn't been great and using complex models of evolution or these tricks as we, I showed you before with these amino acid data recordings. All lineages incorporated so far from tinophores particularly uh, lie within known diversity. Therefore, they do not mitigate potential artifacts. And there is no general consensus about which is the best model to use to, to infer this phylogeny. But what if there is another way of attacking this problem that doesn't need involving all these complex methods? And in fact, there is. Uh, key questions in evolution have been solved, including data from uncharacterized groups, without even having to, to recourse to these complicated models. Uh, what we would like to do is to shorter those long branches, and we have excellent precedents. For example, the origin of eukaryotes is now much resolved to the, thanks to the extraordinary discovery of a whole archaean domain on environmental samples. Likewise, the, the incorporation of data from slow evolving nematodes uh, helped to address a similar challenge, leading to the retrieval of the clade of molting animals, the dysozoans. So maybe we are unaware, 
of unknown early branching animals or other closest relative or slower evolving tenophores, sponges, or plagosaurs. So incorporating these novel lineages would be fundamentally a groundbreaking and, and nobody has tried this in animals to, to my knowledge. Uh, our idea is to tackle the early evolution of animals in a different way, not just by adding more data as people have been doing in the past, but trying to uncover uh, unknown diversity from environmental samples. Uh, as many of you already know in here in, in, this, in, this, in this arena, seawater contains DNA corresponding to all organisms present in there, which can be sequenced using metagenomic approaches. E out of this huge mix of DNA fragment, it is potentially uh, possible to uh, assemble individual puzzles, like here, corresponding to individual genomes. Uh, this approach changed uh, our view on prokaryotic diversity recently, uh, with thousands of genomes discovered this way from, from data from oceanographic expeditions. I plan to do the same for animals, which is currently possible, uh, but what I propose is not just about this new data, but also implementing and evaluating the, the efficacy of novel phylogenetic uh, approaches that in the past have been useful to, to solve similar controversies. Uh, several expeditions, such as the Tara Ocean or Malaspina, have sampled most of the oceans at different stations, depths, and, and science fraction. And they sequence uh, the environmental DNA and the 18S gene, a, a barcode, a short barcode of the 18S, that normally is a good molecular marker to identify taxa at the film level. Uh, these expeditions have released terabytes of data. Uh, and there are more recent and ongoing uh, with similar aims. For example, the, the Trek uh, one that will survey the, the European coastlines. Uh, the refinement of the assembly methodologies, together with the uh, huge amounts of data and computational resources, have recently allowed to, to, receive, uh, to retrieve hundreds of animal genomes, as, for example, uh, Ramon summarized recently in, in, this, in this publication eukaryotic and a few animal genomes. Uh, and these uh, two publications in here uh, that just appeared like one or two years ago uh, assembled some of these uh, animal genomes just based on some of the samples, on a lot of the samples of Tara, but just in one of the uh, oceanographic expeditions. My hypothesis is that there is a diversity of animals that have never been characterized in all these data sets. And as a proof of concept, uh, searching in Malaspina data, I found 18S tenophore sequences in the bottom of the ocean that are dissimilar to known uh, species, as well as sequences from lineages that are branching at the base of the tree and cannot be assigned to any uh, group with confid confid uh, confidently. So these sequence data are already available and proved useful, uh, so preliminary results are promising, uh, but there are still a lot of things to, to do. Uh, the first thing that we would like to do is to, to, to address which unknown animals uh, and close relative may be on these data sets and try to reconstruct the genomes. Uh, we, we are going to focus on those samples in which the survey of the 18S barcodes is promising, in which we found barcodes of tenophore or unknown animals. And we will try to do two things. We will try to reconstruct the entire in TNS, because the, the barcodes is less than 200 base pair, we will try to, 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 to enlarge this antenna marker. And as far as we can, we could try to reconstruct the, the genomes. Uh, when the sampling site uh, in which we are trying to work also have a complementary metatranscriptome, and in the case of the Tara samples, we will map against it to improve the assembly and the gene annotation. Uh, so I, I am aware that retrieving high-quality assembles uh, will be ha hard or impossible. So what I will do a lot of is testing uh, to make sure that we are free of contamination, that we are using a genome that at least is just composed by that particular species. Uh, we will do benchmark experiments. For example, we are going to add raw data from known genomes into a metagenome data set and try to reconstruct it as well as developing methods uh, based on simulations to assess the, the reliability at the different steps. So we would like to, to set up a standardized protocol to retrieve those animals genome, so it could be scalable to new samples from different uh, expeditions. And much can be done, not just about new data, but with the one that we already have, because this is a graph of a publication of 2017 
with a gene present absent on a matrix, in a phylogenetic matrix, uh, in which animal evolution, and in, and in white it show absence. And you can see in tinophores there are a lot of absence of genes in this matrix. So there is a lot of missing data. So even some of reports have shown that the data is not only poor, but is contaminated. So I tr I would, we would try to redress this situation by resequencing at high coverage uh, a few transcriptomes uh, from distantly related uh, tinophores, uh, which quality was poor, and some sponges and quanoflagellates, it, we are able to find some. Oh. So, okay. I think I should close the Microsoft PowerPoint not responded. I just have like three more slides. Okay, there is something that you are not seeing, but now it's blocked. It's a, such a pity, sorry. I am trying to close it. Okay, again. So, uh, we will apply a complementary approaches to answer how animals are related to each other. Uh, basically, two main approaches. One is phylogenomic analysis, in which we will include this newly generated uh, data, this resequence data, as well as this uncharacterized genome that we will assemble out of the, uh, the meta metagenomes. Uh, and this is like a summary of the expected outcome. Uh, so as we, likely the metagenome assemblies will be partial and may contain some amount of contaminant. As I said before, we will conduct experiments uh, under different degrees of both uh, conditions of uh, amount of information and contamination to assess the effects on the inferred relationships. Uh, we also uh, will apply a recently developed method uh, that avoids uh, out-group attraction, this, this, this group that is the closest relative of the in-group that you are working with, to avoid this attraction uh, that hopefully will allow to discriminate uh, between the basal alternative uh, relationships. Uh, and just to, to finish, uh, what is the bigger picture uh, for animals and their relationship with the record of our planet? So we need to put into evolutionary history, into a time scale, to link it with the geological background. To do so, we will use the molecular data set we generate in combination with a one morphological one and incorporating new fossil findings. Uh, for example, there is a really like uh, sponge-like uh, organisms that precedes any molecular clock estimate or newly discovered uh, Cambrian or Nidarian uh, tinophores. Uh, both Cambrian tinophores and Nidarians. So, and for example, something that is, uh, is a challenge to understand is when do, we do this molecular clock estimates, the origin of animals normally lies within a, a peri period that here does not appear, that is the Cryogenian, is a period that is known also as the snowball earth, in which it's assumed that the entire planet was under ice. So it is, complicate to, to reconcile the origin of complex multicellularity under those conditions, but uh, when we do this analysis, it seems that is the case. If we were able, for example, this, this old sponge that it doesn't appear in here, but more or less is, uh, it has been inferred to appear, oh, okay, sorry, does not appear here, like a thousand years ago, it will, it will allow us to, to obviously establish that actually the animals are much older than we previously thought. And just to, to finish, uh, this project will try to, to this two second particular project will bring a, new, bring a brand new source of data uh, for animal phylogenomics. We will characterize uh, new genome diversity. Um, what else? We, we could find even another groups that we are, were not looking for. Who knows, uh, maybe a, a Lofotrocosoan that was not previously present, a new phylum. Um, and we will also improve the, 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 the quality of known diversity, sorry. 
uh, by reconstructing this full length uh, 18S gene and genomes. And hopefully uh, we will be able to, to robustly establish uh, the origin of certain anatomical traits such as the origin of, of neurons. Uh, and that's all by my side. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Thank you, Jesus, for, for the talk. Very interesting story from going to so back in time. So we have some time from, for questions. I, I perhaps start. Uh, you, you are working a lot with fossils, and uh, it's easy or obvious to know that the fossils, they come from a marine system or from a terrestrial system. That's very clear, okay. because this is a comparison that you do all the time. Okay, yes. Uh, what he asked, and it's a really good question, is how can we be sure that an organism is either marine or live in shallow systems or interrestrial? What, when they have, they found this fossiliferum stratum that normally are called uh, conserval lagestaten, they have an associated biota, and by comparing all these associated biota, they could more or less uh, establish which was the origin. This is one thing, by, che by che checking which animals live in there or organisms. And the second thing is also the composition. The composition normally is, uh, of the soils is quite different between uh, marine stratum or other ones. Okay. I, I have another question. Uh, about this, all these multi-gene phylogenies that you show, that you use so much, you never explain exactly what were you using, no? How okay. many genes or yeah. how of the genomes themselves together or... Yeah, what, sorry. Or you probably you changed through time, no? The, the markers that you used? Yeah, sorry. No, normally, the, for this depth of phylogeny, what we use is protein coding genes, mm -hmm. and we check them at the amino acid level that is less prone to potential effects of saturation. So this is what we have been doing so far. We mostly, all of us who work in this kind of uh, deep phylogenies, work with protein code engines. Nevertheless, there are some people advocating to, to use this different kind of uh, apomorphism, like could be the macrosynteny patterns or whatever. But so far, we have been mostly working with protein code engines because otherwise it's really difficult to establish the orthology assumption. But trying to get all the genes, or you just have a subset okay. of genes? Yeah, so this is a good question, really good question, because there are two philosophies. There are more people that are prone to use as many genes as possible, and in a metazoan data set, this could be up to 3,000. And there are people like me, another, like, it's a kind of philosophy that we prefer to do a lot of pruning of being sure to use genes that are not really affected by biases of the methods. So if we found a gene that retrieves a really impossible topology or that is likely to not be properly modeled, I prefer to exclude them. So at the end, my matrices always have less than 1,000 loci, and the ones that I analyze with the like, most complex models, they are about 300 genes. Jesus. Hello. Uh, enjoy, you know, knowing the trajectory of your research. Uh, so uh, I am wondering, in your search for the novel basal metazoan species, you have any specific strategy to s somehow increase the chance of discovery? Because, like environmental DNA sampling, I assume maybe I'm wrong, but they, you tend to discover more microscopic organisms, right? Um, so, I don't know what the, these novel vessel lineages might look like, but are you expecting to find something microscopic or...? Yeah, so, know. we don't know. So, actually, what we are only looking is at the DNA small stretch that corresponds to the barcode that will suggest that this is, for example, a tinophore. But in terms of morphology or how do they look like, we don't know. Uh, so, so, this is something knew that uh, people start to look if like assembling eukaryotic genomes and what they do basically is pulling lots of different metagenomes, so terabytes of data, to be able to assemble things that should be theoretically in a really low amount, a really low yield. So 
I don't know how these organisms will look like, but the only thing is that I know how I will try to find them. I will try to look in stations in which I found barcodes that are suggestive of having data of lineages of our interest, that in this case are non bilaterians such as dinophores, sponges, or other uh, opistocons. What's the proportion like in these environmental samples? You know, uh, what's the proportion of like say metazoan? It's low. Very really low, right? Really low, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it won't be easy. This is something like, it's more drafted as a project that I started, but uh, we will see the challenges when uh, we are uh, in the middle of it. Thank you.